Anyway, this one, uh, you know, what you see is my belief in what do fractures look like down hole. They look like your windshield that you hit with a hammer and put that in three dimensions. And that's what we see. Now, the fractures everywhere that you're getting events, or they're certainly not propped everywhere we're getting events. Uh, and you say, well, John, I know we broke into a well a mile or two away. Well, you got into a natural fracture system. Is that propped? Is it in communication? No. Okay. Well, John, you said they're not single planar by wing fractures. Well, look at that scale. That scale is 400 feet scale units. I actually had a uh, micro seismic technician tell me that my fractures were 350 feet wide, 300 and 400 feet tall, and 500 feet long. And I said, we didn't pump the Atlantic Ocean, you know. <laughs> no, we had multiple fractures in a trend, and, and we see this. This was a very old one. Dirty gels, I've already said this, damaging and also clean gels create even more damage. That's been a real, and I got caught up in that in the early days of my career, the dirty guar and all that kind of thing. Uh, if you have permeability, the worst thing you can do is run a real clean system because these polymers are not in solution and they played out and you have a filter cake. And you take a core and you can build a filter cake and I can peel it off and I can slap the crap out of you and it won't even break apart. Would that be damage? Well, how do you reduce damage? You control the leak off and the colloidal solids and guar and those things do help control leak off. So if you're trying to get ultra clean to solve problems, and I've published papers, you know, trouble with the publishing papers, you don't have word processors to erase all that stuff. It's kind of like the internet. Whatever you do, if you keep, it's going to happen. You're in trouble. But those are some heresies and some things that have been going on in our, our industry. Equipment side, uh, we had a, an attempt to revive turbine pumps. You know, a small company called Slumberjay did that for about 15 years. And they probably, about, and I really think there is some place for it. There could have been things that have changed. But again, bringing back, and fleets of electric power trucks, are they going to take over? Are they going to put us out of business? Uh, no. And then there's another answer. It's Hell no. Uh, it's too complicated, it's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. Maybe, maybe you got long years away. Uh, pure methane and mixtures of methane for fuel. That's a really neat thing. Have any of you done that? A few of you have? It's neat if you got high pressure gas at your well or in your pad. And, and the technology's here and available. Is it gonna take over everything? Uh, you, know, you got service company people here, they'll tell you it's fun to convert all those things and it's real cheap, isn't it? Okay. Uh, we progressed in control systems, minimizing the number of people required. Uh, give away my age and so forth. Uh, I hate it when they say 1965. Some people can add and then, you know, I don't tell people, ask me how long you know, I say a long time, you know, or, or more than 40 years, you know. That, when you get over 50, that makes you old and crap, but, uh, but when I started fracturing, doing jobs, you had a reason for a hard hat, because if it hailed, that was to protect you, because you didn't have frack bands. And we had human beings that stood up on top of the frack trucks, and that's why some people would make you rig up, and still do in some places, a couple hundred feet from the wellhead. Well, we don't have people there. Now when I tell somebody on a job, the treater, I, the guy running the pumps over there with, with one of these mouse, controls is running the job. Much safer and a better way to go. Things, things that people say, well, you know, when men were men, they did frack jobs like that. Well, we did a lot of stupid things. We're, we're not going, I've been on jobs, and maybe you have too, where we lose two or three pumps and we just get some crazy humans out there and work behind a check valve at 12,000 pounds and change out valves. No, thank God we don't do that anymore. We've gotten smarter. How do we disseminate our technology when we're in disagreement on what the technology is? Uh, what's caused this massive, well, how did we ever get here that we got into it, this, all of these arguments and indecision? Uh, I've got a theory. Uh, uh, I, this is in it, I don't know if you've seen the movie Steve Jobs, he really didn't even talk about this, but there was a big deal in that company. When he came into a room, they said, it became a reality distortion field. 
that people would say this can't be done and by the time he got out of the room they were working on it. Uh, we've got some reality distortion in the oil field. Reality distortion field is set up by people who disregard reality because of their perception of truth. I don't know how many people I've talked to. In fact, John Harper and I had a conversation with one of the really big names, old names, as you'd recognize me if I told you he was, and he, and he was telling me, I just don't understand how this, how this sand is working at those depths. It's, it's obviously crushing, and it's, it's obviously crushing. It isn't crushing. If it was crushing, you can see crushing. You can see embedment. And, and how you do that, you do it with the well and the production. It's very straightforward. But it can't possibly be. Well, it is. It really is. But we've got that and we have the, the, the people that are still believing in bi-wing fractures. 1986, we did horizontal drill throughs near well bores and we never found a well that had less than five fractures. Then I had a guy jump me and said, that can't possibly be right. I said, why is that? He said, if I put five fractures in my model, it'll screen out. I said, I wonder which is right, <laughs> reality or your stupid model, okay? The distortion field, it can't be possibly be back. Now I'll pick on some people a minute. I have a fun when I go on location and somebody's doing history matching. Anybody do history matching on fracks? Everybody's got to duck down there when I'm talking about it. And now I'll say, well, let me see your screens and show me how many layers you got. And of course, they got three. And I say, but there's 17 in this well. Yeah, but it's, it's hard to find out what to, you know, you, know, you can't do that. I call it Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> Except I got 20 knobs instead of two. Is the, what we're matching in history matching true geometry down home? Two answers to that question. One of them is no. <laughs> and we know that, but I do use modeling and use the models we have, and, and we can talk more about that. Our creator has planned, and he, sometimes he, I think he gets mad at us oil field people, massive heterogeneity. Uh, sometimes, and we hate to admit this being frack people, Production is due to the quality of reservoir, not due to our fracturing process, prowess. Uh, one of the things you need to be aware of, I see a lot of young people here. You read a paper and, and you say this, it says better than sliced bread and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and they've studied this massive study and they've looked at 20 wells. Of course, highly selective 20 wells. And they prove that something's working. Uh, pitch that in the trash. If you don't have hundreds of wells, if you don't have a significant period of time, uh, it's not worth it. Agenda papers. It's kind of sad. No, no textbooks. Because of lack of understanding, we are left with a great deal of confusion. Except we've done enough now. We've had enough time that we, you know, what's working is out there, it's reality. I don't care if it makes you mad, hurts your feelings. You know, that's one. I, I, buddy of mine, actually he was my boss for a while, but we wrote, to, wrote the first paper I wrote, we wrote together. I was telling John about that last night. We wrote it, we were smart oil field people. We wrote the paper during Mardi Gras in New Orleans. You know. If you're gonna have, have a pot of paper, let's have fun doing it, you know. <laughs> But uh, Steve Holdridge told me this. He says, I reserve the right to get smarter. And you know what? That's the basis of our company. That, you know, well, not, are you old fashioned? No, we jumped in the middle of this slick water stuff. Why? Because it works. You know, don't get caught up in the NIH not invented here. Don't get caught up in, in petty things that can't possibly right accept reality. Don't get in a reality distortion field. Uh, what do we do to get this stuff around? First, using extreme prejudice to decide on what's working. <laughs> can you figure that out? I think so. This can only be done using objective personnel 
Is there such a thing in our industry? I don't know, maybe. Who do not have conflicting interests relating to processes or chemicals? Can we utilize long-term production, statistical analysis to yield answers, which are some are not popular, in some cases, are career destroying? You know, it doesn't take rocket science to pump water and friction reducer and sand. Scary to, to the very large service companies. And it's working. That's the other scary part. Okay? Only with long-term production data, we have enough from hundreds of wells with each area can we objectively evaluate what technology is working. Okay? Okay. Once we've got a legitimate understanding how to stimulate unconventional, we then go into the rest of the world and keep them from making all of our dumb mistakes. Uh, most of the failures that have gone on in Europe is because people went over there with 40 pound cross-link gel and ceramics and 2040 and 1630 propant. Uh, George Mitchell tried that for, that literature says 18, but in reality 30 years trying to get the Barnett to produce. And only his hard-headedness and then tied in with people trying to be cheap and, and going past the we don't need any propant and then screening out with big propant and then using smaller propant and you know the rest of the story. Uh, I have a lot of fun reading books like Frackers and stuff like that. People go to hell for lying, I'm going to tell you that. Anyway, what's happened since this three and a half, four years ago? Movement towards slick water and small sand has intensified with major oil companies pumping slick water and only 100 mesh in oil reservoirs. Now that's classically, oh my God. If I go back 10, 15 years, custom, our customers would shoot you if you brought 100 mesh to location. You're gonna destroy our prop and pack. It'll be the end of the world. We gotta change. It's working. New North American innovation and oil field desperation, we've moved away in most er er areas from the reality distortion field and started using common sense. I hope. Almost as a shock, here's a big shock, we moved to shorter spacing, more clusters with larger volumes of fluid and have achieved better results. What's that about? It's about surface area. Now there's a lot of work to be done to enhance the surface area and that's kind of what this group and others are doing. Many are realizing that much of the confusion and completion real type relates to the permeability. I teach two different deals. I teach conventional fracturing. When I get above 10 or 20 microdarcies, we recommend the standard sand type uh, ceramics, resin coated sand and so forth. On the other hand, when I get below that, then it's a slick water and they're tremendously different in design and implementation. Uh, if you understand the effect of permeability, uh, you can go a long ways. Uh, St. Andrews formation is one that'll drive you to a little bit of that because some of it's permeable and some of it's conventional and some of it's not permeable and you need to do slick water and you got to do a little science to know what you're doing is right. Perhaps the hardest part is realizing the majority of classical fracture theory is totally wrong. Admitting they've been wrong for 50 years is pretty hard for oil field ego, egos to swallow. The advancements that have been made in the previous 12 years have been accomplished by North American individuals who for whatever reason defied conventional thinking and intuitive reasoning. Instead they've followed their instincts instead of following the advice of service companies or self-appointed gurus. For those like myself who have gone through multiple downturns, this one's been rough. But right now I believe we see the light at the end of the tunnel, not a train approaching. We, we hope that's the case. For those of us that have thrown off the rock mechanics dominated but sadly lacking frack models, we realize that fracture geometry is not the same universe as what was illustrated by single planar fractures we've worshiped for so many years. I use frack pro and not putting any of them, they all can be done this way. And since I follow, since I know in naturally fractured shale systems and naturally fractured carbonates, the fractures tend to follow those systems 
I have a way uh, with my modeling to optimize and design a slick water fryer. In fact, I had some people question me and I gave one of my presentations, you really use a model to run slick water? And I said, for the first time in the history of my stimulation work, I actually know what the viscosity of the fluid is that we're pumping. Well, we got M primes and K primes in our models. You know all those are wrong? Did you know that? How many of you frack with Sugar Land water? How many of you frack with Duncan, Oklahoma water or, or Houston water? And the gels that you use have no breakers. Are you pumping any gels that have no breaker in it? And then I have people worried about the complexity and all that nonsense. And the friction data is wrong because it was all run smooth wall pipes. Wall roughness affects friction, although it's not off as far as you might imagine. Okay? Very good work underway. Two or three groups that are actually working on models utilizing artificial intelligence uh, gathered from production and calibrated data, we'll be able to simulate these fractures. And that'll really mess up people's minds when we do that. Shining Star has been the development of a plethora of both cemented and non-cemented staging tools which are functional and available. Uh, we've come a long ways in getting safer and more dependable pumping equipment. And we talked about that before. Now things emerging today, biota, the DNA stuff, um, I'm sure you may have seen that JPT. I had a lot of fun with these people. This is a brand new diagnostic to use in production and drilling. It's a pretty exciting thing because of the cheapness that you now can get DNA analysis and utilize it again in your well. Uh, water lens, you can, there's a little box you can get. It'll give you water, instantaneous water analysis for about 14 analytes. And it'll do it in about 10 minutes, which is a little better than most of what we know. Exciting stuff. Protection pump ends, understanding that when you put that lateral over there 300 feet away, if you don't do something to the other well, you're going to put your frack in that other well. And that technology is, is so very important in where we're going in our industry. And we're having fun with that. DIT. You might want to dig that up. They're, they're pretty much a startup, but that's electromagnetic pulse technology uh, where you use um, resistivity tools. And what's exciting, most exciting about that is I believe, and boy, this is really going to scare the hell out of people, is we can see the propant in the fracture. That's pretty scary stuff. But it's just in its, in its beginning. But I think, I think eventually, uh, and actually, interesting enough, I'm on the advisory board and there actually are microseismic people on the board also. If you know you're, be close to your enemy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, functional refact diversion, um, I'm peddling stuff. We've just patented some processes which will actually work, unlike most of the bridging, diverting agent processes out there. But I'll leave, leave that for questions later. Prop and properly placed, we've been doing something really weird. And actually, you know, people, some other people tell me they've done that. Uh, we don't start out with small sand and tail in with big sand on slick water. We start out with big sand and tail in with small sand. In other words, we start out with 4070 and we tail in with 100 mesh. Oh my God. Why would I do that? Well, most of you know Stokes' law, what you pump first in the well, that's always been the case. If you don't have perfect prop and transport, what you pump first is going to settle right at the well bore. So you might want your bigger prop in at the well bore. Those of you who are tailing in on slick water treatments with curable resin coated sand, uh, I got some land in Arizona with seashore all around it. Help you, help you get your retirement home. Uh, Basic understanding of fundamental stimulation theory. That's kind of sad uh, that there is so little training and understanding about that. Well, I've harassed you a long time. I'm ready to be attacked and ask questions and anything. See if you. <laughs> uh, See, if you don't ask me questions or harass me, you believe everything I did. Yeah, James. John, I wanted your opinion on, uh, you know, we've got a lot of pretty good technology that's been placed 
in our uh, in this slick water arena, right? And some of the old technology, squeezing back in and different things.